Hi, this is Bob Scully, and welcome to another edition of The World Show, The Energy Series, a series in which, you know this, we've often had some very thought-provoking guests. Well, this week, a special guest, Canadian author and broadcaster Ezra Levant, who is certainly thought-provoking. He's going to provoke some thoughts, I'm sure, but he might also provoke a few people, and that's what he does in life, and he does it extremely well, intelligently, eloquently, and with a great deal of wit. And he published a book a couple of years ago called Ethical Oil, which asked a simple question. Why shouldn't America buy oil from a democracy like Canada before buying from autocracies like Venezuela and Iraq? Now he asks another question. What's wrong with fracking? His book is called Groundswell, The Case for Fracking. It's out from Signal. And uh, he will provoke your thoughts. And maybe he'll provoke you, but I'll make a prediction. You won't switch channels. He's fascinating to listen to. Here's Ezra Levant. Ezra Levant, welcome. Thank you. Let me read from your book. Those people are idealists, and there is a place in this world for idealism. But the true test of character isn't how moral they claim they would be in some hypothetical scenario. The true test of moral seriousness is how we make real decisions between imperfect choices. And we ain't talking about the future of democracy here. We're talking about something more concrete and kind of an unexpected topic. What is the title of the book? Well, this book is called Groundswell, The Case for Fracking. And who I was talking about there are environmental idealists, but they're actually utopians. Because one day we might invent some fantasy fuel of the future that's perfect in every way, affordable, practical, and zero environmental footprint. But that day is not here, and even Greenpeace says we can't move to this renewable economy for at least 40 years. So the real choices, at least for the rest of our lives, are between choices of fossil fuel. Mm -hmm. Are you going to get your oil and gas from North America, or are you going to get it from an OPEC country? A country like Ukraine, are they going to buy it from Vladimir Putin's Gazprom at high prices with political extortion behind it, or will they frack their own shale rock and get the gas out of that? So there are no perfect energy sources, but if you weigh the pros and cons economically, but also the ethical pros and cons, environmental responsibility, peace, the treatment of workers, human rights, I make the case for Western democracies to develop their own oil and gas using the amazing technology of fracking. And in there, uh, this, this quote kind of denounces a certain hypocrisy, let's say. Yeah. And, and it's interesting, there are cases that are almost amusing. There's one fellow in there who at some point builds a, a case for natural gas. He loves it because it's a heck of a lot cleaner than coal, which is true. But then later, he flips. He's against natural gas. The same guy a few years later, nothing has changed really, but all of a sudden he realizes it's just not the fad to be for natural gas. So he just turns his, his, his coat around. You're talking about Bill McKibben, who's an environmental activist with a group called 350. He was for natural gas when natural gas was extremely expensive, 10 bucks or more per um, thousand cubic feet. And um, North America was actually looking to import liquefied natural gas from countries like Qatar. So Bill McKibben was for natural gas when it was expensive, foreign, exotic, controlled by dictatorships. But because of <laughs> fracking, fracking has brought the cost of natural gas down by, a th it's cut it by two thirds. Mm -hmm. And it's made it cheap and plentiful. And now that Americans can actually buy their own natural gas, Bill McKibben is against it. And I'm not sure why. Either he always was sort of in favor of OPEC oil and gas, that's sort of a, 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 a darker view of it. Or maybe he just is a perpetual activist. And the worst thing that could ever happen for an environmentalist is to declare that the earth is saved and now he'd have to get a new job. Here's a fact about fracking. Because the greenhouse gas emissions for natural gas are about half of that for coal to generate mm -hmm. the same amount of power, this cheap, low-cost natural gas has displaced coal in more and more U.S. power plants. That fact alone has reduced America's greenhouse gas emissions by 11% in the last five years. Yeah, I mean, they've been going down, and yeah, that, there's no of, other explanation. That, not that solar panels, mm. not wind turbines, and it wasn't even the economic blip of the Great Recession. Fracking, and it's amazing, you would think, who has saved American GHG emissions? Not the environmentalists, Halliburton. But it, yeah, but if we want to get more precise, not even fracking, which has been around for 70 years or right. so, uh, the, 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 the idea that you, that you shake up the, the, the stuff that's underneath there, uh, but that you can do it horizontally. A drilling technique is even more important than fracking. And the two combined, that's the wow effect. I mean, it would be like, normal drilling would be like a straw. You stick a straw down. 
Horizontal drilling is just what it sounds like, a bendy straw. Mm -hmm. And so you can follow horizontally along the seam of the sedimentary rock. And what that also does is it reduces the land area you need to drill. Because from the same little frack pad, they call it, you can go down and out that way. Down yeah. and out yeah. that way. And so it leaves less of a trace upstairs. Exactly. And remember, this is all happening a mile or deeper underground. So I've been in Pennsylvania, one of the most fracked states in the Union. Mm -hmm. And you can barely notice it because there's a fracking pad maybe every mile or two. And it's small. It's like an acre or so. It has a very modest footprint compared to other energy sources like open pit mines. And it, oddly enough, I, you mentioned Pennsylvania. I've been out to, I think it's Williamsport right in the middle. You see some of that there. And people are comfortable with it. When I lived in Louisiana, in southwest Louisiana, over to, to Lake Charles and so on, people were comfortable with these donkeys. People were actually proud to have a little oil well right. in their rice field. But... In other places, the, there's something in the culture going on that makes people reject it. In Montreal, around Montreal, people said, I ain't going to have no damn uh, well on my lawn. Right. And, and they, they never went further than that. What would it get them or right. what would it be? Yeah. It's just uh, kind of obscene to them to mm -hmm. see that. We have to have some sympathy for that. It's a visceral reaction. Right. Right. We cannot force it on people right. either, right? Well, I mean, as you point out, Pennsylvania's been drilling for oil for more than a century. They're used to it. Same in Texas. So... In 90% of the oil and gas wells in North America, they are fracked. It's, act, it's called unconventional, but it's actually normal. Mm -hmm. But when you use the word fracking, which sounds like a swear, I mean, and, in, and hydraulic fracturing doesn't sound much better, does it? And in French, gaz schist, that almost sounds like a swear also. Yeah. So you use these newfangled, somewhat scary words for a new technology to people who've been doing fine without it. You add in the anti-fracking propaganda. Like there was a documentary in 2010 called Gasland by Josh Fox. Yeah, yeah you're Scary, about that. lighting faucets on fire, poison water. So you're in a place that has never had oil and gas production before. You're in Montreal. And you see this film and you hear the bad news and you think, why would I take the risk? But it's actually junk science to say that fracking is dangerous or new. It's been done more than a million times in America, mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of times in Canada. And according to the EPA itself, the Environmental Protection Agency, there has never been a single confirmed case of drinking water contamination in 67 years. But in the end, probably, can we predict? I mean, if, if we had to, obviously it's here to stay and it's necessary and it's, it's efficient and fruitful, but probably you're going to see it more in the North Dakotas of, of, of the world uh, than in the downtown Torontos of the world. I, I mean, that's kind of logical, right? So absolutely. I think the companies will just, <clears throat> to avoid all the hassle, will tend to go to places that are less populated. Oh, listen, don't worry about the companies. They'll do just fine. Let me give you an example. Total SA, one of the big mega uh, oil and gas companies based in France. Well, France put a moratorium on fracking. Well, Total just signed a deal in May with Vladimir Putin to frack Siberia. So don't you worry about the mega companies. Mm. I'm worried about towns and communities that could use the jobs, use the royalty payments, um, and be energy independent. That's why I mentioned Ukraine, Ukraine briefly, because... You know, Gazprom, the world's largest natural gas company that's owned 51% by the Kremlin, it sells a third of Europe's energy, almost 100% in places like Ukraine, Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, Finland. So those places not only have to buy, buy gas at two, three times what we pay for in North America, mm -hmm. but remember in 2006 and 2009, Putin, as a political punishment, turned off the taps in yeah, Ukraine in the dead of winter. In the dead of winter. That's not even an economics issue. That's a political punishment issue. So if Ukraine and Poland and Germany and these countries fracked their shale resources, not only will it create jobs and lower the price of energy, but they would be free. What's the number one weapon that Putin uses in Ukraine? It's not fighter jets. It's not tanks. It's energy. Why couldn't Europe put sanctions on Putin? How are you going to put sanctions on a guy who sells you a third of your energy? And you say in the book that, uh, in your opinion, uh, Iran, Qatar, and Russia are sandbagging the worldwide fracking uh, efforts to maintain their monopoly. Yes. Um, but at the same time, Putin is kind of hoist on his own petard if he's fracking in Russia yeah. but himself. He doesn't care about hypocrisy. He's an ex-KGB agent. He'll do what <laughs> it takes. At the same time that, that Putin is signing deals with BP and Total to frack Siberia, he is denouncing fracking in North America. And let me give you hard evidence of how OPEC is trying to demonize fracking. Again, why would they do that? because they don't want competitors and they don't want fracking to get a foothold in Europe. Two quick examples. The movie Gasland that I mentioned mm -hmm. was produced with the assistance of a state employee of Venezuela's state film agency. 
In fact, this was boasted about by the Venezuelan embassy in Washington when, when Gaslan when didn't, didn't, didn't get the Oscar. Yeah, yeah. The, the embassy tweeted, oh, we didn't win because it was made by a Venezuelan. So Hugo Chavez, an OPEC tyrant, he's passed away now, but he helped make mm -hmm. this film. Another movie starring Matt Damon, an anti-fracking drama called Promised Land, funded in part by Image Nation from the United Arab Emirates. Again, an OPEC country. Third fact, Prince Al-Walid, the great tycoon and Saudi prince, wrote a 14-page memo to the Saudi uh, energy ministry ringing the alarm bell about shale gas, saying it was a, quote, significant threat that required swift action. They know that fracking is not only an economic boom to the United States and is reducing U.S. imports, but God forbid if places like Europe started to frack, mm -hmm. they would lose market share. And Saudi Arabia really doesn't have a lot to sell out of the oil and but gas. But that effort that they're, the sandbagging that they're doing uh, probably will fail simply if we look at the track record. Um, nuclear power plants, for instance, have had accidents, but not many. Yeah. And we've had people on this series come in and say it's actually quite safe, yeah. much more than putting oil on trains, for that yeah. matter, if you want to look at that. Um, and in some cases, like Chernobyl, it was incompetent uh, engineering. Um, and therefore, it'll come back. That's their prediction. Um, but if we just look at Deepwater Horizon, and offshore drilling. Offshore drilling has not stopped because of Deepwater Horizon. We've just gotten better at doing it safely. Um, so one can assume that this is a rear guard action that these countries are, are, are I mean, I, don't, I don't see that they can stop the worldwide exploitation. Well, of if they can delay it five, I would say they've delayed it for certain. I mean, you have moratoriums in places like New York State, Quebec, Newfoundland announced one, Nova Scotia, so Canadian provinces and states. There's big battles in places like Colorado, mm -hmm. California. So if you delay production, you'll never get that production back because you're not drilling today's barrel of oil, you're drilling tomorrow. So you can factor both oil and gas. So even if Russia and OPEC countries are allowed to demonize and denormalize fracking, turn it into like a tobacco industry kind of mm -hmm. shameful thing, they're, they're trying to use words like climate, criminal. I mean, they're trying to so denormalize the industry that it's not even open to debate anymore. If they manage to delay fracking by five or 10 years, that's literally worth billions, maybe trillions to them. Yeah, that's true. It, it's a, in that sense. It, uh, but I'm just saying that they, all, all this, all this will, will turn to dust at some point. It's a, maybe it, it, it cannot. It cannot halt something that in the end will be proven to be relatively you, benign. You We've been doing nukes. it for 70 years. You mentioned nukes, though. There was a period for about 30 years where not a single new nuclear reactor yeah. was built in America, not a single new refinery, and this was environmental extremists, I think, over-regulating. And remember, the most effective way for Gazprom and Qatar Gas to make their ends met is not for the Saudi king to come and say, don't you frack, we would immediately see his true interests. But if they have front men like uh, Hollywood celebrities, like environmental activists from Canada, from the United States, from Europe, undoing our own industries, Vladimir Putin will laugh and count his rubles. And one of the most amusing points is water usage. In your book, you huh. give statistics on how many gallons of water it needs it are required to come up with a T-shirt or a pair of jeans right. throughout the production cycle, as opposed to a well. And that well will return its water eventually. Yeah. We'll only use water once yeah. at two million gallons, and then it's 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 returned uh, correctly back into the environment when the well is capped up. Whereas jeans, it's 186,000 just for a pair of jeans, 186,000 gallons just to produce a pair of jeans. I'm trying to remember the exact stat. I think it's lower, a little bit lower than that. But you make a good point about we use water for so many things, industrial, uh, residential, agricultural. So when people complain about water use, can I get, break a little high school chemistry here yeah, for you? Yeah, sure. Remember when you burn a hydrocarbon like methane, that's CH4, and you burn it with O2, right? Methane and oxygen, you light it. And what does it emit? Emit CO2. And what's the last part of that chemical equation? Steam. Mm -hmm. So when you burn 1,000 cubic feet of, of gas, like that's four bucks worth of gas, it actually releases 11 gallons of water. I know that sounds crazy to burn gas and get water, but it comes out in steam. Fracking at, uses less water to get the natural gas up than is emitted when you burn the natural gas. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. Yes. The actual combustion of methane releases more steam into the atmosphere than it uses water to frack it. It's actually a net positive to the water cycle.
And another interesting insight in there that uh, it's the way you put it that is amusing, but also thought provoking. You say fracking is a big industry, but so is the anti-fracking industry, oh, yeah. uh, which you take on, meaning activists who make a living out of just attacking it and who are disappointed when, when, they, when they win. They, they, they like fracking to go on. It's kind of perverse. Fading starlets like Daryl Hannah has found a new life, a new career, not as a movie star, but as an anti-fracking activist. Yoko Ono, you know, not a lot in the news for her own songs these days, but she's with Artists Against Fracking. Yoko Ono is not a PhD in hydrogeology or mm -hmm. things like that, but she seems relevant and smart and with it, and she's a celebrity, and I hate to say it, but in our low information culture sometimes, a celebrity endorsement counts. It's like when Jenny McCarthy, the starlet, says, hey, nobody, vac nobody vaccinate your kids because it creates autism. And thousands of people listen to her because she's a celebrity. And we have kids that get diseases. When Yoko Ono says, hey, don't frack, if some people listen to her because she's a celebrity, we're losing thousands of jobs because some Hollywood celeb says so. It almost seems, when reading your book, as if this is a better horse to ride than socialism and communism were. And a guy like Chavez is kind of the proof of that. He's had more success, uh, or had more success on, on this score than he had with his economic system, which is so rotten. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a new religion. Well, there's some bona fide environmentalists who are genuinely worried about their water, or about earthquakes, or whatever bona fides. But there are some people who've been called watermelons. Green on the outside, red on the inside. Who, I mean, you sort of saw them during the Cold War. They were too sympathetic to Russia and too unsympathetic to our own side. Even Walter Durante and his coverage of Joseph Stalin and the, and the, uh, the famines. What did those people all do in 1989 when the Berlin Wall fell? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe they rechristened themselves environmentalists and took that attack to capitalism. So they weren't doing it in the name of socialism, they were attacking capitalism in the name of Clean environmentalism. Again, I point out, though, that they never attacked the biggest oil and gas countries in the world. I like to quiz people. I say, what's the biggest oil company in the world? Is it ExxonMobil? Is it BP? Is it Royal Dutch Shell? No. It's Saudi Aramco. Mm -hmm. Bigger than all those three combined. What's the biggest gas company? Gazprom and Qatar Gas. We don't even think, we don't even know those names. And the biggest coal burner is? China's the biggest, China, and they're the yeah. biggest coal producer. Yeah. They now emit double the GHGs of America. But where's Greenpeace? When was the last time Greenpeace had a protest in China or Saudi Arabia? Well, the answer is obvious. You don't protest in China unless you want the Tiananmen Square treatment. You don't protest in Saudi Arabia. They shoot you. Mm -hmm. So these environments, yeah, they're very selective. And they go after the gentlest, most ethical energy producers in the world. And I understand why they don't go after Vladimir Putin. He'll throw you in jail. In Canada, we'll probably give you a government grant, and the United States will, will nominate you for an Oscar. <laughs> but uh, in, in, in the book, in kind of a sort of a, uh, uh, an indirect way, you, you are paying tribute to one form of idealism. You, you do say, listen, these guys are a little bit, you know, pie in the sky, but maybe we'll have a, a very nice, inexpensive solar uh, heating system one day. We'll have a technology and so on. You're not against that. No, listen, one day. I mean, we have had evolutions, I mean, at one point in time, guano was a source of energy, whale oil. Mm -hmm. But then we invent kerosene, so we save the whales in that way. I mean, one day we will invent this fantasy fuel of the future. I mean, there's so many movies about them, like dilithium crystals in Star Trek, or Soylent. in that movie. <laughs> yeah, or Avatar, they were mining unobtainium. I love that name, unobtainium. I want that day to come, but I do not believe in alchemy, turning lead into gold. I do not believe we can force it and simply say in 10 years we're going to find this miracle fuel. You just can't force it. And even Greenpeace says their energy revolution will take 40 years. So in the meantime, what energy do you want to use? And don't tell me you're just going to turn down the thermostat in the winter and you know, carpool. That will not make a difference. And in fact, the world's largest energy consumers are in the third world. And they're starting from abject poverty. And they will not simply say, we will do with less because our wealthy, energy-intensive first world that already had our industrial revolution says, oh, you folks in China, India, Africa, stay poor. They want their two-car family with air conditioning and yeah. electrical light, too. So we will not stop energy consumption. In fact, in North America, we're slowly, our oil consumption is going down about a percent a year. We're getting more efficient. I was going to say, willy-nilly, though, 
um, they are doing some good. They're doing it perhaps in a shrill and historical way and, and, not, and twisting the facts. But we do care about the fact that emissions have gone down in North America since 1992. We do care. I think that's the number one underreported environmental fact. I put it to you that not one in a hundred environmentalists know that U.S. greenhouse gas emissions are at the lowest in 23 years. And yet, they're, they're at the root of that progress in their own crazy way. No, you no, know? no, no. The reason emissions are down is not because of Al Gore. It's not because of some Kyoto Protocol that America never ratified. It's because of the ingenuity and freedom of American businessmen, Halliburton to be precise, that in 1947 yeah. invented fracking, and then, as you say, added with horizontal drilling, Oil and gas men lowered that. It was not because of the environmental movement. It was the desire of entrepreneurs to find value in worthless shell rock. But I'm, I'm trying to give them some credit. But they don't they've, deserve it. Well, they've given us a consciousness of it. They went to town with it and, and, and exaggerated all kinds of things yeah. and, and maybe bought their dinner with it too. Yeah. Uh, but they have raised our consciousness. Okay, but I think it's very selective. They've ignored China, India, Brazil, European mm -hmm. countries. No, no doubt. I think that, uh, let me give you an example. You've heard of the group called PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Mm -hmm. They're vegetarian activists. Yes. When they tell you to stop eating meat and stop wearing fur and leather, they're not eating a big turkey drumstick while they're doing it, right? They're morally consistent. They're vegetarian themselves. Mm -hmm. And I, even though I think they're far out there, they have a moral consistency. I have never yet met an, met an environmentalist who is against fossil fuels, who themselves doesn't drive, jet around, wear petrochemical-made fibers, use... Mm -hmm. so there is no moral consistency. Al Gore with his jet-set lifestyle, all these folks too important to follow their own creed. At least PETA, when they're telling you to give yeah, up no, meat, I, aren't maybe, chomping down on a steak. Yeah, no, no, no. In that sense, you're absolutely right. Um, and, and so there are many battles to come. And as for Levant, you'll be waging them, I'm sure. <laughs> and we'll be watching. Uh, we're too chicken to, 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 draw, to just get in the fight, but we will be watching. And, uh, and more power to you. Thank you very much. Ezra Levant. And now here's something else coming up on The World Show. I think those are the two things that mm -hmm. prevent people from, doing, from following an entrepreneurial path. One is the quest for perfect information. Uh, which never happens. And secondly, this, this idea that even if I had a good idea, I can't possibly execute on it because there are other people who know more, who have more, who can execute on it. And so storage is an example of that, where frankly, I was driving along the highway, saw a number of fac storage facilities and thought to myself, why are there storage facilities all along this highway? Why are they here? No one actually lives here. No one stops here. Why are they all here? And I can assure you that there were millions of people before me who had the same thought. Many people would have said to themselves, why is it? I think the difference is, is I stopped the car and knocked on the door and uh, found out why they were there. And then a business was born. First of all, I found out two things when I knocked on the door. I say, can I have a locker? And I'll never forget this. Someone comes out, sort of, you feel like you need a bulletproof vest, first of all, to walk <laughs> in there. And someone comes out sort of five minutes after you've knocked on the door and you say, can I have a, a locker? And they say, well, we have nothing, we're full. You think, how can this facility possibly be full? You go to the next one right next door, and they say, well, I don't have a 10 by 10, but I have a 5 by 5, and I'll give it to you for half price. So immediately, you've learned two things. You've learned, one, that for whatever reason, there seems to be a lot of demand for this product that seems suboptimal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And two, you've got a management uh, style which makes no sense, because I've got one locker, and I'm discounting it. What, why am I discounting it? And so uh, what, what you quickly found out was there was a perception that customers wouldn't pay for convenience and security. And so the, what, was being, what was happening in Canadian cities was storage facilities were being built outside cities, outside of high household income areas, on cheap land on, in tin single-story boxes. Mm -hmm. And what we did was we created a business that was completely the opposite, which was multi-story uh, facilities, safe, convenient, targeting women, who frankly make most of the decisions around uh, storage, and commercial tenants in high household income areas competing with retail. And uh, you know, our proposition was we would get paid back in terms of pricing and lease up, and, and that, that is what happened. Well, Linevest was really created with the fundamental proposition that a group of reasonably successful investors and entrepreneurs were gonna put a big chunk of their own money, most of their money, lock it up for 12 years, and do what they perceive to be right, uh, and invite people to invest alongside us if they so choose rather than thinking about it the reverse way, which is how little money can I put in with my own and then get mm -hmm. everyone else's money and try and make money on their money. It's really fundamentally around how do we make money for ourselves and if people want to 
commit with us, that's, that's fantastic. We will stay true to our, to our mission. And this concept of alignment, uh, you see it, I mean, if you look at Wall Street, the fundamental problem in Wall Street is you had employees, people making decisions based on short-term bonuses as opposed to long-term equity. Yeah, I mean, it, it, just at the core, that's yeah. it. And the, the reason is, is because there was a lack of alignment. Ezra Levant was our guest this week on the Energy Series of The World Show. I'm Bob Scully. Have a great week. Thanks.